Welcome. Now, I know I have about 30 minutes, and I've got the man with the sign here to tell me 10, 5, stop. So um, I would like to catch up and give you a little bit more overview about myself, but I've got so many things to tell you that I'm going to launch in. Is that all right? Okay, so let me see if this works. Righteousness by faith. The title on the flyer says, His Righteousness by His Faith. Now, the concept of righteousness by faith, uh, at least the sentence, you know, oh, the message of righteousness by faith, by faith, brother, you know, at least the concept is there. But I wanted to add those two words, his righteousness by his faith, because your righteousness and my righteousness are like what? Filthy rags. You know that word, filthy rags? You know what it means in the, in the Hebrew? It's actually the menstrual period pad. Yeah, after use, of course. Filthy rags. That's our righteousness. So as much as we're trying to actually work on our righteousness, on do the right things, is in fact the, one, the righteousness that we want is His righteousness. And by the way, how many have seen and fall short of the glory of God? How many? All. Okay, now listen to this. What I'm going to do in this presentation is there's a wall here between you and me. Behind me is the huge concept of righteousness, my faith. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put some dynamite in different corners of this wall. And as we go along, I'm going to detonate the dynamite. Boom, here, boom, here, boom, here, boom, here, boom, here. And towards the end, it will be the kicker. I will kick it. The wall will fall and hopefully you'll be able to see it. How many have seen fall, uh, fall short of the glory of God? All. Okay. They just shall live by faith. Hold on a second. You just told me that everybody has seen. Who is the only one that is just? Oh, oh hold on a second. He's, his righteousness by his faith. Because the just shall live. By faith. Do you know that Jesus lives by faith? Lives by faith. Okay. What will be the opposite of righteousness by faith? It will be unrighteousness by unbelief. Would you say that? Unrighteousness or doing the things that the devil will do by unbelief in the word of God. Correct? So unrighteousness by unbelief will be the opposite of righteousness by faith. How did he accomplish that? He caused Adam and Eve to do something of the devil's nature. And he accomplishes that by distortionating the character of God. Following? Distortionating the character of God and not believing in God. How many of you believe in God? Can you see your hand? How many of you believe God? Amen. Is there a difference? Because the devil believes in God, friends, and he trembles. Now, let me, let me ask you a question. I'm going to just do a short prayer, and I'm going to exemplify the believing in God versus believing in God. Dear Heavenly Father, please, we call for your presence here. Believing in God. Believe in God. One, two, three, four, five... There's more than two or three called by his name here? Yes or no? Okay. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you because you're here. Why? Because where there's two or three gathered in his name, I am. I actually am. Did you notice the difference? God is in the community of believers where two or three are gathered together in his name. We thank him for his presence. Okay, so unrighteousness doing the wrong thing by an unbelief in God, accomplished by Satan in the garden, first of all, by a distortionating of his character. Question, when Satan appeared as a serpent, in which tree was he on? The tree of good and evil. And what he spoke were things of good and evil. And when they committed sin, 
and they heard the voice of God, what was their perception about God when they heard about God? Running towards him or ran against him? Friends, sin, no matter how deep you go in sin, will never bring you close to God. Never. Romans 2, 4 says it is the goodness of God that will lead you to repentance. The goodness of God. But at that point, sin is just has a perception in their minds that God is a terrific being that is coming to kill us, not to save us. Just recently, a friend of mine told me in my church, she said that she was at a marketplace and there was a person with a... Um, uh, we struggled selling some goods in the marketplace. And she said, let me pray for you. And this man said, don't pray for me. God doesn't love me because I am gay. I want you to notice something. There's something in the perception of God in the mind of that individual that will not come make him to go to God to be safe. And that is the masterpiece of the devil. Distortionate the character of God that we will not run to him to acquire his righteousness by his faith, by believing in what he says. Let me illustrate. So far, I just detonated two dynamites. I'll, I'll keep on going. I'll, as I go forward, you know, I'll tell you how many dynamites I'm just detonating, okay? Now, the book of Job chapter 1 says the following. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. The reason why is Satan and not Adam when, was there is because Adam, the son of God, had led the throne to Satan. So as a representative of the humanity here on earth, up went Satan. But noticed, and the Lord said unto Satan, Whence cometh thou, or where are you coming from? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. Are you familiar with those, with those verses? God asked Satan, Where are you coming from? He says, From going to and fro and going up and down on the earth. Has anybody checked the ancient, uh, it's called the Hebrew ancient lexicon? I'm going to show you something. What is the plan of Satan? To distortionate the character of God so that we not believe him. And because we don't believe God, we will not be acquired of his righteousness. Now notice, that expression we are going to first look at is from going to and fro. I'm just going to show you from the ancient Hebrew lexicon. You ready? Because it's going to detonate. Okay, so that is from the ancient Hebrew um, lexicon, right on the right on your screen. The reference is H7751. Going to and fro, meaning, he actually says this, from whipping or lashing out at someone or something out of hatred or punishment. Satan, where are you coming from? I'm coming down from down there, from whipping them off out of anger and punishment. Oh, my, my. He just confessed his mission. What is Satan doing here? I'll put it a little bit bigger. Weeping or lashing out at someone or something out of hatred or punishment. Satan, where are you coming from? By the way, what do you need to whip someone? You need a whip. It was not a trick question. You need a whip, correct? So in his hand, he has a what? He has a whip. But it's not over. Notice this. And from walking up and down, from walking up and down, I'm going to show you from the ancient Hebrew lexicon. So from walking up and down, arrow H1960. Oh, sorry, 640, uh, six sorry. Uh, it's a picture, it's a pictogram, uh, the pictogram in, that, um, in those characters, those Hebrew characters, is a picture of a shepherd's staff. There is a picture of the palm of the hand. Combine this man's staff in the palm. 
Hold on a second. What did he have in one hand? A whip. What does he have on the other? A staff. Oh, man, like that one? Like that one? A whip and a staff? Satan, what are you doing down here? I'm whipping them with punishment and anger. But like a shepherd, I'm also leading them. Do you know what that means? Have you ever seen the pharaohs? That's what the pharaohs had. A staff and a whip. And you know what it meant? It meant this. The crook symbolized that the pharaoh is the shepherd or the carer of the people. Is that good or evil? That's good. The the flail is the source of necessary punishment to maintain order in society. Is that good or evil? At least when it comes with anger, what would you say? Do you realize that it's a combination of what would you say? Good and evil. Oh, man. Oh, man, Satan, what are you doing down here? I'm making them believe that I am you. Did you get that? I'm actually making them believe that I am you. So somebody will reject a prayer for him because he's afraid of you. And he will run away and will say, no, don't pray for me. God does not love me. And he will not come to him to, by faith and accept his righteousness. Ho! Oh. Uh, did you felt the detonation? Okay. Gets better. Okay. Friends, there's so many people debating about the name of God. Yeshua, Jashu, Jesus, Jesus. Yahweh, Jeho- Jehovah, Elohim. Do you know that the definition of the name of God is not actually a five or six or seven letter word? It's actually a character trait. In fact, in Exodus 34, verse 5 says this, And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And he's not going to say a name, friends. He's not going to say a name in Aramaic. He's not going to say a name in a particular pronunciation. He's not going to say a name in that term. He's going to say a list of character. So I want you to follow me closely for, for, to reveal what the devil has done Two even Christians that will fail us to go to Christ to obtain his righteousness by his faith. You ready? The dynamite is about here. Exodus 34 verse 6. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord, God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abandoning goodness and truth. Is that good or evil? That's good. Verse 7, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin. Is that good or evil? That's good. Now notice this. And thou will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, upon the children's children, and to the third and fourth generation. And for some people in the world, will that be good or evil? Evil. Now in fact, there's a Bible verse, version that translates it this way. Having mercy on thousands of looking evil and wrongdoing and sin, he will not let wrongdoers go free, but will punish, send punishment and children for, or, or, on children for the sins of the fathers and on their, on their children's children to the third and fourth generation. That's interesting because in the same book of Exodus, God says, do not punish the children for what? For the sins of the fathers. What's going on here? What's going on here? Let me tell you something. In Genesis 21 verse 1 says the following. And the Lord visited. I want you to read with me that reference. H 6485. H 6485. Can you remember that? H 6485. That's actually the Hebrew reference. And the Lord visits Sarah as he had said. And the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. Which was what? Giving her? A son. Okay, now, 
Genesis 39 verse 4, and Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him, and he made him an overseer over his house, and all that he had, and uh, he put into his hand. That word overseer, H6485, the same, right? Do you know why? Because Joseph was the overseer of Potiphar's house, and our overseer is the one that visits every single business of the owner. So he's visiting all the interests of the owner. Question, is Joseph punishing every business of the owner? Question, did God punish Sarah with a child? Some might think, uh uh-huh. If you know my children. Genesis 50, 24. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I die, and God will surely, H6485, visit you. Do you think God visited them? To punish them or to set them free? Okay. You and bring you out of this land into the land which he shared, he swore, sorry, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Exodus 3, verse 16, now is the fulfillment of it. And now through Moses, notice what he says. Go and gather the elders of Israel Together and say unto them, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, appear unto me, saying, I have surely, what? Visited you, H6485, and seen that which is done to you in Egypt. Did the Lord visit them? Yes or no? Okay. Exodus, now you tell me if this is good and good. Or if it's good and evil. Exodus 36 verse 6, 34 verse 6. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, God merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abandoning goodness and truth. Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin. And by will no means clear the guilty. Visiting H6485. The iniquity of the fathers upon the children, upon the children's children, and to the third and the fourth generation. Do you know that Zacchaeus was a thief, and he was the son of a thief, and he was the grandson of a thief? Do you know what Jesus said to Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus, I'm going to visit you. Was he living in his iniquity? Did he have the iniquity of his fathers and the fathers? Yes or no? And what did Jesus do? Visit him to tell him what? That I am the Lord, the Lord, merciful and abundant in goodness. I can forgive you iniquities. I have done it to thousands and to millions. And I'm here for you. And I'm not going to leave you guiltless like that. I'm going to visit you in your iniquity to save you. He doesn't leave the lepers. He visits the lepers. Man, if you want his righteousness, you better know what his right doings are. Did you get that? If you want his righteousness, if you want his character, you better know what his character looks like. You're 35 years of age, you divorce, and you don't want anything to do with God. You are an alcoholic because your father was an alcoholic. And you know what God does when you are all drunk in the gutter? You know what he does? He visits you. He visits you. Now tell me what is evil about that. Nothing. Do you realize what the devil has done? He's making of God a God of good and evil. As if our God comes from the tree of good and evil rather than from the tree of life. I'm getting excited. I just detonated this one here. Did you felt it? Okay, good, good. It gets better. Okay. I want you to notice something. Isaiah 65 verse 15 says, And ye shall leave your name for a curse, and to my chosen for the Lord. God shall slay thee and call his servants by another name. You should leave your name as a curse, and God will call you by another name. I wonder what that name will that be. Look, look what Second uh, Chronicles seven fourteen. If my people, which are called by what, by my name, 
And they were baptized in the name. And we think that being baptized in the name is somehow an abracadabra formula. And we don't realize that being baptized in his name means being immersed in his character. Oh. I forgot my Bible down there. I thought I had all the references here. I'm going to show you something here. Let me just go back here. Brian. No, 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 that's all right. Oh, well, give it, give it to me. Brian, can I ask you a question? No. <laughs> I'm going to ask you a question, Brian, because I know your name. <laughs> now, Brian, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Have you been baptized by his name? <laughs> Tricky question. Okay, well, it's, it's a tricky question or it's a simple question. Have you been baptized by his name? Baptizing them in the name. Have you been baptized in the name? Okay. This is the name of God. You've been baptized in his name, right? Watch this. Righteousness by his faith. Watch this. Brian, Brian. Merciful, gracious, long-suffering. Now his wife is saying, he's not talking about my husband. <laughs> Abandoning goodness and truth. Keeping mercy for thousands. Forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin. And that, will, and that will by no means clear the guilty, but you will actually visit in those that live in iniquity. Frank. Did you been baptized in his, into his name? Yes? Okay. Listen to this. You've been baptized into his name. Frank, Frank. Merciful. And Frank is thinking, all right, well, I, the first one is no, I don't even get a tick on the first one. Frank, Frank. Merciful, gracious, long-suffering, and abandoning goodness and truth. Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity. And now Frank is just remembering that person that stole the lawnmower and is thinking, eh, except that guy. <laughs> but you know, Frank, Frank, you visit those living in iniquity, those living in the gutter, and you go there to visit them, to tell them about a God that saves and forgives. And if you put your name on the name of God, how many here realize something? That you do not fulfill the name. Ah. So who calls you by his name? Who calls you by his name? He does. Now, watch, watch, watch. He calls you by his name. And you, when you look at yourself in the mirror and being as objective as you can be, you go through the list of the name that you've been called and you go, uh-uh, I don't really, I'm, I'm not really. Guess what? So why on earth is he calling you by his name? Because Christ lives by faith. Do you think he's a stupid? Do you think he doesn't know that you're not merciful? Do you think he doesn't know that you go and you pray for something and you get up out of the prayer and you have not forgiven your sister because your sister put your mother in a nursing home? Do you think God doesn't know that you haven't forgiven in iniquity? He knows. So why on earth is calling you by his name? Because you ought to live by what he says, not by what you think. Because you ought to live by what he says of you, not by what the mirror says of you. Now, let me, let me tell you, I still got a lot of time. I haven't seen any signs. That's good. No, 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 now you can't jump into five. You need to go into ten, okay? All right. Twelve. Oh, good, good, fantastic, plenty. We are around here. A friend told me 
that he had a problem with pornography. And he said, and he stopped and left his wife because the pornography led him to actually commit adult, a feather of adultery, I should say, feather adultery by establishing a relationship with another woman. And he told me, I got tired of pretending to be who I am not. And I said, oh, friend, you actually don't get it. By living in sin, that's when you're pretending to be who you are not. Because the one that called you by his name says, that shall not commit adultery. That's my son. He is abundant in truth and mercy and goodness and gracious. And when you actually go out to live in sin, that is there when you are pretending to be someone that you have not been called to be. Did you get that? Okay, let me, let me, let me illustrate this way. Had a, had a, uh, a young man calls me. And he says, um, I've got depression. So we do pa pastoral, pastoral counseling and family, family counseling also through our practice. And he says, I've got depression. He's a Christian young man. And he says, I've got depression. I said, oh, what else do you have? And the guy sort of like, so what do you mean? He said, all right, well, what else do you have? I said, well, otherwise, good. I said, oh, do you have joy? And he said, no, no, I don't have joy. That's strange. And I said, why is that? Have you been called by his name? And he goes, are you, I said, are you being baptized by his name? I said, yes. Okay. Have you confessed your sins and you actually um, received salvation from Jesus Christ? Yes. Do you realize that you've been called by his name? Yes. Do you realize that now you are heirs of his promise? Yes. Do you realize that the first thing, that the, one of the first things that the, 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 spirit, the fruit of the spirit is, is love, joy. And I started scratching my head in front of him. I said, that's strange. And he goes, what? That you don't have it. And you know what he said? I don't have it because I don't feel it. And I said, and what do you know? And he goes, what? I said, yeah, what do you know? Think about it this way, friend. You're born in an unbalanced world that cannot even reconciliate the magnetic north with the physical north. So this world is already tilted. This world is already unbalanced. You know, have you ever met anyone that has not been brought up in a non-dysfunctional family? Every time that I hear that sentence, uh, yeah, I've got a problem because I was brought up in a, in a dysfunctional family. I say, congratulations. You just make the hot pot. You know, you just, everybody has been born in a dysfunctional family. David says, I was conceived in sin. And I said, do you realize that you are unbalanced? Yes. Do you realize that your professors in school were unbalanced? Yes. Do you realize that you, the children that you play with, they, they were unbalanced? Yes. The, do you realize that all the circumstances around you that happened to you, they were all unbalanced? Yes. Do you realize that you are an unbalanced individual? Yes. So how on earth do you say that you got no joy? Your opinion is worth nothing. You are unbalanced. It's just a mere opinion from an unbalanced person. Who is the only one that is not unbalanced? Who is the only one that has not been stained by sin? Christ. And I said to him, do you know what he says? That he has given you joy. I don't feel it. I said, and what is your opinion had to do with anything? Let me, let me, let me illustrate. There's a son that sometimes have actually sung this song in the morning, worship, singing to the Lord, crying. Crying because I didn't feel joy. And because I didn't feel joy, I was crying. Before I sing the song, let me, let me ask you a question. How many of you have ever felt lonely? Can I see your hands? Okay. How many of you that have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, how many of you are lonely? You better put your hands down because if you put your hands up, you're calling him a liar. Because he says he will never leave you, never forsake you. And then you tell me, but I feel lonely. And what is your opinion has to do with anything? He says he has not forsaken you. But I can't see it. He's called by faith, mate. He's called by faith. 
is acquiring his character, not by seeing it. How many here are called Thomas? Any Thomas in the room? No Thomas in the room. None of you have excuse. If your name is not Thomas, you don't have excuse. Only Thomas wants to touch in order to believe. Wants to see in order to believe. You don't need to see it. You don't need to smell it. You don't need to touch it. You don't need to hear it. You need to believe him. And he has called you not to be an adulteress. If you've got a problem with lying, you're actually saying that he is a liar. Because he says, my son, oh yeah, I know my son. He's been baptized by my name. He shall not lie. When you lie, you're walking away from your calling. And you're missing on his righteousness that he wants to impose upon you by his faith. Friends, you don't need to believe that you are not a liar. This is not about positive thinking. You don't need to believe that you're not an adulteress. You don't need to believe that you're not a covetous person. You need to believe him that he says that you are not. Did you get that? So, and singing this song in the morning, and sometimes, you know, I start singing it, crying. Some of you might know it. Everything's all right in my father's house. In my father's house, in my father's house. Everything's all right in my father's house. There is joy, 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 joy. There won't be joy. There is joy. Do I need to feel it? No. Because my unbalanced emotions are need, need to bow down to the God of heaven and no vice versa. Do you get what I'm saying? Some of you know I heard my, my wife's testimony. My wife fell asleep in Christ about 18 months ago. I will see my wife in my father's house. In my father's house. In my father's house. I will see my wife in my father's house. There is joy, joy, joy. Do you know why? Because I believe him. That he wants to impart upon us his righteousness. And part of his righteousness is his faith. Is his joy. Friends, if we are Christians that are sucking lemons all around the world, I'm sorry. But that doesn't attract anybody to Christ. How many of you are so worried that think, that think, that your life is in such a turmoil that do not have peace. Anyone? Now everybody's scared of lifting their hands. Do you know what Jesus said before he left up to heaven? Uh, by the way, since you are my inheritance and everything that belongs to me belongs to you as my children, I leave you peace. People looked at me and said, oh, man, Oscar, how are you doing? And I said, what do you mean? And I said, well, your wife is sleeping in Christ 18 months ago. How are you in such a peaceful state? I said, peace is mine, my brother. Peace is mine. I don't deserve it. My heavenly father that is so good to me has given it to me. Peace is mine. Do I need to feel it? No. I'll tell you what. By believing by believing, by believing, by believing, and by beholding, by beholding, by beholding, by beholding, you become changed into the image that you're beholding. And you're beholding a father that says that he has given you peace in the middle of an earthquake. And as you shake and say, thank you, Father, for the peace. Thank you, Father, for the peace, because you have given it to me, and I believe in the middle of the earthquake. And interesting enough, I will play the heart in my father's heart. 
In, in my father's house, in my father's house, I will pray the heart. In my father's house, there, there is joy, joy, joy. By the time I finish the song, I'm not crying, friends. Because my senses, my, my members, my feelings, my heart want, want to say, oh, sorry, you. And I said, okay, you can cry like a crying baby. I'm going to look at my Jesus. He says, I've got joy and taken it. And my members and my heart is crying. He says, I've got faith, I'm taking it. He says, I've got victory, I'm taking it. Everything that will make us into his image, he has already given it to us. And we acquire it by faith. Not by feelings, not by seeing it, but by believing he that has faith on us. That's called righteous by faith. Oh, I got to spend minutes. Stop. Okay. <laughs> Do you mind Do an experiment for, for me just for seven days? Just seven days. Just an experiment. For seven days. Second Peter chapter 1 says that he has given us all things through his promises, exceedingly precious promises, that we might actually be partakers of his divine nature. Since he has already given it to you, friends, and now you discover this afternoon that you don't need to feel it, you don't need to see it, you don't need to even experience it or touch it, you just need to believe that you do, because he has, a, he has promised and he has said it, would you then, for seven days, rather than ask the Lord as if you are some kind of destitute children, just thank Him for all things that He has given you? Joy, peace, long-suffering, patience, joy, rejoicing. Just thank Him. But I don't feel it. And what is your opinion has to do with it? Let's go to close with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, because it's somehow you've seen something in us that our most objective analysis in the mirror cannot even see. Not even our most positive outlook on ourselves can actually see. You see something in us and you call us by your name, which is your glory, your, your righteousness, and you share that with us. Lord, I thank you because part of that gift is actually faith. Thank you for the faith that you have given us to be able to acquire that righteousness that is yours. And thank you for the faith that is also yours towards us. In Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen.